Ladies and gentlemen, as with the uh, last uh, round of hearings, uh, those who have leave to appear have been notified of that fact. Uh, they, in turn, where they have counsel appearing, have told me who their counsel are. There's therefore no occasion for separate uh, announcement of appearances. Uh, again, uh, there were some applications for leave to appear uh, by individuals which uh, I did not uh, allow. Uh, the solicitors for the Commission have uh, written to each of those persons concerned to try to explain as uh, best we can why it is uh, that their application for leave to appear uh, has not been granted. Uh, I think I am right to say that each of those who sought leave to appear uh, but whose application was refused was a consumer uh, who uh, had a particular uh, matter that he or she wished to bring to the attention of the Commission. Uh, I say to them as I say uh, uh, to others and have said previously that uh, the submissions that we receive through the website uh, are uh, particularly important to us. Uh, we do look at them, we do try to digest them and to uh, uh, become aware uh, of the issues that individuals are seeking to raise with us. Now, Ms Orr. <clears throat> Commissioner, this is the second round of public hearings for this Royal Commission, and this round of hearings will inquire into aspects of the financial advice industry. Financial advisors provide advice on areas of consumer finance, investing, superannuation, retirement planning, estate planning, risk management, insurance and taxation. The financial advice industry has been the subject of considerable scrutiny in recent years. There is good reason for this scrutiny. Work released by ASIC in 2010 suggests that between 20 and 40 per cent of the Australian adult population use or have used a financial planner. In the 12 months to July 2016, approximately 2.3 million Australians aged 18 and over received advice from a financial planner. This round of hearings will explore some of the issues that directly impact on Australians in their dealings with the financial advice industry, including the charging of fees for financial advice that is not provided or not provided in full, which we will refer to as fees for no service, the provision of inappropriate financial advice and instances of improper conduct by financial advisers, including misappropriation of customer funds. We will also examine the disciplinary and regulatory regime for dealing with misconduct by financial advisers. The structure of this opening statement is as follows. We will begin by explaining some of the key features of the financial advice industry. Second, we will touch on some of the events in the financial advice industry in recent years, focusing on events involving Storm Financial and Commonwealth Financial Planning Limited. Third, we will explain some of the key features of the legal framework governing the provision of financial advice, which has been the subject of considerable reform in recent years and is in the process of undergoing further reform. Throughout these hearings, we will invite consideration of whether the reforms that have been made to date have achieved their intended purpose. Fourth, we will summarise what consumers have told the Commission about their experiences with financial advice through public submissions submitted via the Commission's online portal. Fifth, we will summarise some of the regulatory outcomes obtained in recent years in respect of misconduct in the financial advice industry. Sixth, we will explore what the two external dispute resolution bodies who deal with disputes relating to the provision of financial advice, the Financial Ombudsman Service and the Credit and Investments Ombudsman, have told the Commission. 
As we noted in the first round of public hearings, these bodies are being replaced later this year with a unified body, but they have provided information to the Commission about a body of complaints from consumers going back almost 10 years. Seventh, we will explain the roles of the two key industry bodies, being the Financial Planners Association and the Association of Financial Advisers. Eighth, we will summarise what financial services entities have acknowledged to the Commission as their own and their related entities' misconduct and conduct that has fallen below community standards and expectations. Much of the information we will refer to was provided in responses to the letters that you, Commissioner, sent to a range of entities late last year and early this year. Finally, we will briefly address the nature of the evidence that will be heard over the next two weeks, giving an overview of the case studies that the Commission will be considering. We will explain why each of the particular topics to be explored in these hearings is of significance to consumers and to financial services entities, and why these case studies have been chosen. We will highlight the key themes and questions that we see running through these case studies, upon which we will invite written submissions at the end of these hearings. We turn first to the key features of the Australian financial advice industry. The financial advice industry is of significant value to the Australian economy. In 2015 to 2016, Australia's financial advice sector was estimated to be worth $4.6 billion in revenue. The number of participants in the financial advice industry is also significant and has grown substantially over the course of the past decade. In November 2009, there were just over 18,000 financial advisors in Australia working for 749 advisory groups operating over 8,000 practices. As at the 1st of April this year, there were 25,386 financial advisors registered in Australia, an increase of around 41 per cent from the number recorded in late 2009. As at the 1st of June last year, there were 5,822 financial services licensees that offered financial advice to consumers in Australia. The financial advice industry is highly concentrated. As at late 2017, the top five entities, the four major banks and AMP, collectively held a market share of about 48 per cent by industry revenue. About 30 per cent of the total number of financial advisors on ASIC's financial advisors register worked for one of the major banks. 44 per cent of advisors, both aligned and non-aligned, operated under a licence controlled by the largest 10 financial institutions. The majority of financial advisory firms were small, with about 78 per cent operating a firm with less than 10 financial advisors, and about 90 per cent with less than 50 advisors, and 95 per cent with less than 100 financial advisors the average number of financial advisors operating under a particular financial services licence was 34 individuals. New South Wales has the largest share of financial advice practices, with over 30 per cent, followed by Victoria, with over 20 per cent, Queensland, with under 20 per cent, Western Australia, with over 10 per cent, South Australia, under 10 per cent, the Australian Capital Territory, Tasmania and the Northern Territory, all with under 10 per cent. There are a number of key participants in the financial advice industry to whom we will be referring throughout these hearings. These participants include financial advisors, also known as financial planners, holders of Australian financial services licences and dealer groups. A financial advisor may be licensed directly by ASIC to provide advice or may be an employee of an organisation licensed by ASIC to provide advice or may operate as an authorised representative of an organisation licensed by ASIC to provide advice. 
Some financial advisors operate in dealer groups, which are also known as financial advisory networks. Where advisors operate in this structure, a group corporate entity holds the relevant licence, permitting the financial advisors who are members of the dealer group to operate as its authorised representatives and provide financial advice to consumers on its behalf. Such financial advisors provide advice to consumers under both the licence and the commercial brand of the dealer group. Financial advisors and dealer groups can be classified as either independent or non-aligned or as aligned with a financial institution, such as a bank or a wealth management services provider. There are various ways alignment can occur, including through vertical ownership structures, contractual relationships, commissions and other forms of remuneration. Financial advisors can only use the terms independent or non-aligned or similar words or expressions in relation to their business if they meet certain legislative requirements. These include not receiving commissions, volume-based payments, other gifts or benefits from an issuer of a financial product, and operating without any conflicts of interest arising from their associations or relationships with a product issuer. Financial advice is provided in relation to a range of topics pursuant to the relevant conditions of the relevant licence. The five main types of financial advice sought by consumers, measured as a percentage of the Australian financial advice industry's revenue for the 2016 to 2017 year, were superannuation and retirement advice, being advice that seeks to help individuals plan for their financial situation in retirement. This advice accounted for approximately one-third of industry revenue. Loan and investment advice, being advice for determining the most suitable loan product and financial asset allocation for a consumer. This advice accounted for approximately a quarter of industry revenue. Self-managed superannuation fund advice. This advice primarily concerns the advice received to support investment and administration decisions made by the trustees or directors of a corporate trustee for a self-managed superannuation fund, and it accounted for approximately one-fifth of industry revenue. There are also other services, including estate planning, which accounted for approximately one-tenth of industry revenue, and tax advice, being personal financial product advice that also deals with the liabilities, obligations or entitlements of a person under taxation laws. This advice accounted for almost one-tenth of industry revenue. Of the approximately 25,000 financial advisors registered in Australia, 8,704 have told ASIC that they have completed a degree at bachelor level or above, representing 35% of all advisors. We turn to events in the financial advice industry in recent years. There have been several prominent scandals in Australia in relation to the provision of financial <coughs> advice in recent years. Two of the most prominent of these scandals involved Storm Financial and Commonwealth Financial Planning. Storm Financial was a financial advice company based in Townsville in Queensland. <coughs> Since around 1994, the Storm Financial investment model encouraged investors to borrow against the value of their home and to use the loan monies to invest in indexed share funds. Storm also encouraged investors to take further investment steps based on moves in the share market. The advice was one size fits all investment advice. In 2009, Storm collapsed with losses totalling over $3 billion. By the time of its collapse, approximately 3,000 of its 14,000 clients had suffered significant losses as a result of implementing the financial advice provided. Many of the investors were retired or close to retirement with few assets and little income. 
Some of these investors lost their family homes or had to postpone their retirement for lengthy periods. In 2010, ASIC brought proceedings against the founders of Storm, Emmanuel and Julie Casamatis. ASIC alleged that the Storm investment model was flawed for investors who were retired or approaching retirement with little or no income and few assets. The case centred on a sample of investors who had been advised to invest in accordance with the Storm model. In August 2016, the Federal Court found that the Casamartises had exercised their powers in ways which caused or permitted inappropriate advice to be given. In permitting the Storm investment model of advice to be provided, the Court found they had breached their duties of care and diligence under the Corporations Act. The Court found that by failing to give reasonable consideration to the circumstances of the relevant investors, Storm provided inappropriate advice which exposed the relevant investors to devastating consequences. In March 2018, the Federal Court imposed a penalty of $70,000 from a maximum penalty of $200,000 on each of the Casamartises and ordered that they each be disqualified from managing corporations for seven years. The Court found that the Casamartises had focused on managing Storm's profitability and paid too little attention to the interests of vulnerable investors. In the interim, ASIC had entered into settlement agreements with various institutions with the effect of providing compensation in relation to losses suffered on investments made through Storm. In 2012, ASIC had entered into a settlement agreement with CBA to make available up to $136 million as compensation to many CBA customers who borrowed from the bank to invest through Storm and suffered financial losses. This was in addition to payments of approximately $132 million that CBA had already provided to Storm investors under its resolution scheme. In 2013, ASIC had intervened in a class action brought against Macquarie Bank in respect of Storm, as it had concerns about the fairness of settlement arrangements. The full Federal Court agreed that the distribution of the settlement sum was not fair and reasonable to all group members, and a revised settlement arrangement was arrived at, whereby Macquarie Bank agreed to pay $82.5 million by way of compensation and costs. And in 2014, ASIC had entered into a settlement agreement with the Bank of Queensland to pay approximately $17 million as compensation for losses suffered on investments made through Storm. The second prominent scandal <coughs> that we will refer to involved Common Commonwealth Financial <coughs> Planning Limited. Allegations of misconduct within Commonwealth financial planning were unearthed by a whistleblower, Mr Jeff Morris, who made a disclosure to ASIC in 2010. Mr Morris reported that certain CBA financial advisers were advising clients to invest in high-risk but profit-generating products that were not appropriate for them, and in some cases, switching products without the client's permission. Mr Morris also reported that in some cases this involved forging clients' signatures on documents. When the global financial crisis occurred, thousands of clients of Commonwealth Financial Planning, many of whom were nearing retirement or already retired, lost millions of dollars as a result of this misconduct. More than $22 million in compensation was paid to clients who had received inappropriate financial advice from two Commonwealth financial planning advisers, Mr Don Nguyen and Mr Anthony Orca. However, it later became apparent that the misconduct extended beyond these two advisers and CBA subsequently implemented a second compensation program. In October 2011, ASIC accepted an enforceable undertaking from Commonwealth Financial Planning, which included the review of the advice given to clients by an additional 16 advisers and any compensation to clients arising from that review. 
three additional Commonwealth financial planning advisers and six advisers from another CBA advice arm, Financial Wisdom Limited, were subsequently identified as also having provided inappropriate advice, and their clients were also included in CBA's compensation program. CBA voluntarily commenced the Open Advice Review Program in July 2014. The program was open to customers of Commonwealth Financial Planning and Financial Wisdom between 1 September 2003 and 1 July 2012. As at the 31st of December last year, the Open Advice Review Pro Program had conducted 8,658 assessments, 2,503 of which were assessed as requiring compensation, a total of $37.6 million in compensation has been offered, including negotiated settlements and refunds to address incorrect fees and implementation errors. We turn to the legal and regulatory framework for the financial advice industry. The provision of financial advice to Australian consumers is governed by a complex and interlocking set of legal rules and remedies derived from legislation and the general law. The relevant legislation is the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act and the extensive regulations and legislative instruments made pursuant to them. This legislation coexists with and interacts with the general law, including contract, tort and fiduciary principles. The contemporary legal framework was progressively set in place following recommendations from the 1997 Financial System Inquiry chaired by Mr Stan Wallace. In 1998, ASIC was formed and took responsibility for consumer protection in the financial sector under Part 2, Division 2 of the ASIC Act. In 2001, the Financial Services Reform Act was passed. Among other things, this Act established the current licensing regime for holders of Australian financial services licences. It opposed, imposed prescriptive conduct and disclosure obligations on financial advice providers dealing with retail clients and put in place requirements for provision of product disclosure statements for financial product sales. The regime originally created by this Act has since been extensively refined and reformed, with the result that it is now highly detailed, complex and specific. It has been described by some as obscure and convoluted. The legislation defines financial products and financial services. A particular type of financial service is providing financial product advice. A person provides financial product advice when they give a client a recommendation or statement of opinion or a report of either of those things that is intended to influence a person in making a decision in relation to a particular financial product or class of financial product. The legislation defines two types of financial product advice. Personal advice, which is advice given to a person in circumstances where the provider of the advice has considered one or more of the person's objectives financial situation and needs, and general advice, which comprises all other financial product advice. In general, a person may only provide personal advice or general advice if they hold an Australian financial services licence or are a representative of a person who holds such a licence. The regulatory framework for financial advice contemplates that there will usually be two or three separate entities involved in the provision of personal advice to a retail client. Depending on the business structure, they will be either the financial services licensee, which is usually a body corporate, and an individual who is an officer or employee of the licensee acting as its representative in providing advice or an individual who is an authorised representative of the licensee, or a corporate authorised representative and an individual 
who is an authorised representative of the licensee. An entity that holds an Australian financial services licence will be subject to a number of general obligations under the Corporations Act, including the requirements in section 912 capital A of that Act. Among other things, a financial services licensee must do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by the licence are provided <coughs> efficiently, honestly and fairly, have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest that may arise in relation to the provision of financial services as part of the financial services business of the licensee or its representatives, and take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives comply with the financial services laws. Financial advisers are also subject to a number of specific obligations under the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act. Several of these obligations came into effect on 1 July 2013 with the introduction of the Future of Financial Advice reforms. The FOFA reforms, as they have come to be known, arose in response to the 2009 inquiry into financial products and services in Australia by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, which considered, amongst other things, the Storm financial scandal. We will outline some of the key obligations under the FOFA reforms. First, since the 1st of July 2013, when providing personal advice to a retail client, a financial advisor has had an obligation to act in the best interests of the client in relation to the advice, and an obligation only to provide advice if it would be reasonable to conclude that the advice is appropriate to the client. Second, where a financial advisor provides personal advice, and sometimes also for general advice, the client must be provided with a financial services guide before the financial advice is provided. A statement of advice must generally also be given, setting out prescribed information, including the basis on which the advice was given and any interests, whether monetary or not, and whether direct or indirect, that might be reasonably capable of influencing the advising entity or any of its associates in the provision of the advice. Third, since the 1st of July 2013, financial advisers have been prohibited from receiving particular benefits known as conflicted remuneration. A benefit will be conflicted remuneration if it could reasonably be expected to influence the choice of financial product recommended by the financial advisor or to influence the financial advice given by the advisor. An example might be a commission earned where the advisor recommends a particular product. However, there are a number of exceptions to the conflicted remuneration prohibition. One significant exception relates to life insurance commissions. Financial advisers can continue to receive commissions in relation to life insurance products, although changes to this arrangement have commenced on the 1st of January this year. Another significant exception is referred to as grandfathering. A financial, advice, a financial advisor can generally continue to receive conflicted remuneration if it is paid under an agreement that was entered into before 1 July 2013. Fourth, since the 1st of July 2013, financial advisers have been subject to additional disclosure obligations in circumstances where they charge ongoing fees to clients. An advisor who charges ongoing fees must provide an annual fee disclosure statement and must give clients the option to opt in to the ongoing fee arrangement every two years. Fifth, financial advisers are also subject to statutory prohibitions on unconscionable conduct and misleading or deceptive conduct. Further, 
the ASIC Act contains two implied warranties that are also relevant to the provision of financial advice. The first warranty is implied into every contract for the supply of financial services to a consumer. It is a warranty that the services will be rendered with due care and skill. The second warranty applies when a consumer makes known to the supplier of a financial service any particular purpose for which the service is required or the result that the customer wants to achieve. The implied warranty in these circumstances is that the services then supplied will be reasonably fit for that purpose or are of such a nature and quality as to achieve that result. A number of law reforms are currently underway. Reforms to lift the professional, education and ethical standards of financial advisers were announced in February last year. The reforms include compulsory education requirements, supervision for new advisers, a code of ethics for the industry, an industry exam and ongoing professional development obligations. A Commonwealth standard setting body, FASIA, will be established to develop these requirements and govern the professional standing of the financial advice sector. The new requirements will commence on 1 January next year. From this date, new advisers will be required to hold a relevant degree before they are eligible to commence the supervision year and to sit the exam. Existing advisers will have two years to pass the exam and five years to reach a standard equivalent to a degree. The Code of Ethics will not commence until 1 January 2020. Reforms to increase the accountability of financial product issuers and distributors were announced in December 2016 with a draft bill released in December 2017. This bill adopts two key proposals from the Murray Financial Services Inquiry. The introduction of design and distribution obligations on issuers and distributors and a product intervention power for ASIC. It is intended to ensure that financial products are targeted and sold to the right consumers and where products are inappropriately targeted or sold, ASIC will be empowered to intervene in the distribution of the product to prevent harm to customers. Legislative changes in relation to ASIC are also in progress. The ASIC industry funding model, which recovers costs of ASIC's regulatory activities from industry, commenced in July last year, with further reforms to come. The ASIC Enforcement Review was established in October 2016. During 2017, it consulted on, among other things, industry codes in the financial sector and ASIC banning powers. All of the law we have referred to is complemented by a suite of secondary material, including guides produced by ASIC, industry codes of conduct and the practices adopted by external dispute resolution bodies. We will refer to relevant ASIC regulatory guides throughout these hearings. The legislative framework for the financial advice industry is the subject of detailed consideration in background paper 7, which was prepared by Professor Pamela Hanrahan and is available on the Commission's website. The Commission welcomes comments on that paper which may be provided to the Office of the Solicitor Assisting the Commission. We turn to the information we have received from members of the public in relation to financial advice. We make some observations about the public submissions. The types of conduct that have been referred to in these submissions include conduct that is relevant to the issues we will be canvassing throughout these hearings. The public submissions have referred to instances of Australians being charged fees for no service by financial advisers, including continuation of fees for ceased services, fees for premium services that were not received, 
and fees for advice that has not taken the client's needs into account. One example involved a customer being charged premium fees for a managed investment account when deposits were held in a zero growth cash account over a period of 10 years. A former financial advisor reported several instances of former clients continuing to pay annual review and other service fees despite there being no advisor assigned to their account following the advisor's <coughs> departure from the company. A significant proportion of the submissions received relate to inappropriate advice received from financial advisors. Many submissions refer to financial advisors, advisors providing advice encouraging Australians to engage in lending they are not capable of servicing over the long term. Other themes from the public submissions include inappropriate advice in relation to investing savings and funds borrowed against private property where the customer has requested conservative or low risk investments. Members of the public have told us that they have been led to invest in high risk investment schemes that were inappropriate for their individual circumstances, which has caused substantial losses over short periods of time. In one example, a couple approaching retirement who had sought financial advice to set up an allocated pension fund were convinced to set up a diversified portfolio and lost approximately $170,000 over the next 17 months. Members of the public have lodged submissions about advice received where they could not reasonably be expected to understand or manage the ongoing risk associated with the investment. These include submissions from vulnerable people, such as elderly people and people with a disability. Members of the public have also lodged submissions about advice pressuring them to consolidate or roll over their existing superannuation into an in-house superannuation product. In one example, a couple who paid approximately $1,000 to a bank for the provision of a financial advice plan told the bank that they did not want to transfer their superannuation into another fund as they were enjoying a good return rate and low fees. The advisor's plan nonetheless recommended the couple move their superannuation into a higher fee account and recommended financial products exclusive to that bank. Members of the public have also raised concerns in their submissions about actual or perceived conflicts of interest between their financial advisor and a financial services entity. Members of the public have raised concerns about a lack of transparency in relation to the financial advisor's role and their remuneration arrangements with a particular financial entity. Members of the public are concerned that financial advisers are often only recommending particular in-house or commissioned products. A number of submissions refer to financial advisers engaging in improper conduct in order to drive greater investment in particular in-house products. This conduct includes falsifying documentation to support higher levels of lending, or more aggressive investment strategies. One submission concerned a retired couple who sought increased returns over general pension funds available through their bank. Their advisor falsified their needs analysis and put them in high-risk investments that dropped significantly in value over a short period. When the couple sought to protect their remaining assets from further loss, the advisor could not be contacted to resolve the issue for almost a year. We turn to the work of ASIC in connection with the provision of financial advice. ASIC is the key regulator providing oversight and enforcement in relation to the financial advice industry. Commissioner, you will hear from Mr Peter Kell, Deputy Chair of ASIC, immediately following this opening statement about ASIC's work in this area. ASIC has told the Commission that since 1 January 2008, it is aware of 383.117 
million dollars of compensation being paid to clients who have suffered financial loss as a result of the provision of financial advice or as a result of a failure to provide ongoing services as part of an arrangement to, provide, to receive financial advice. ASIC has told the Commission that as at the 28th of February this year, approximately 305,946 customers have been paid or agreed to be paid a total of $216.421 million by five entities in compensation as a result of fees paid for no service. Of this total amount, $117.8 million has been paid by CBA, $49.314 million has been paid by ANZ, $41.313 million has been paid by NAB, $4.715 million has been paid by AMP, and $3.276 million has been paid by Westpac. Each of these entities estimate that they will pay further compensation yet, with the total compensation that will be paid to customers across these five entities uh, being estimated at approximately $218.939 million. Across these entities, more than 310,000 customers have been affected, with a number of the entities still considering the total number of affected customers. ASIC has also told the Commission that since 1 January 2008, in respect of authorised representatives, employees of licensed entities or other individuals providing financial services, it has obtained 60 enforceable undertakings and 39 negotiated outcomes, cancelled 116 financial services licences and suspended 27 more, imposed additional licence conditions on 18 licensees, obtained banning orders against 387 individuals, issued 14 infringement notices for misconduct, imposing penalties totalling $149,000, commenced 12 civil penalty proceedings, which have led to the imposition of penalties totalling $23.64 million, and commenced 50 criminal proceedings. A number of these regulatory outcomes relate to the provision of inappropriate advice, including 31 enforceable undertakings and nine negotiated outcomes, seven licence cancellations and two suspensions, 75 banning orders, eight civil penalty proceedings leading to the imposition of penalties totalling $23.1 million and two criminal proceedings. We turn, Commissioner, to the submissions provided by the two principal external complaints resolution bodies currently operating in the financial advice area. These are the Financial Ombudsman Service and the Credit and Investments Ombudsman. Financial services entities can elect to be members either of FOS or the CIO. Each of the entities the subject of the case studies to be explored in these hearings are members of FOS, the Financial Ombudsman Service. The Financial Ombudsman Service told the Commission that as at 30 June last year, around one quarter or 27 per cent of its 13,422 members were financial advisers. This group made up the largest proportion of FOS membership. FOS told the Commission that in 2016 to 17, it dealt with 1,681 disputes in relation to investments and advice. These involved complaints about financial advisory services, managed investment funds, stockbroking, trading in derivatives, options and cryptocurrency, and managed investment schemes such as timeshare, horse racing syndicates and agricultural schemes. Of the 626 disputes about advice accepted by FOS in 2016-17, to 17, around half were in relation to a financial advisor. 
the most common complaints to FOS in relation to financial advisers concerned inappropriate advice and failures to follow customer instructions. FOS gave the Commission some examples of the sorts of disputes they have dealt with, which included instances where risk profiling practices and procedures had not appropriately addressed the client's attitude to risk or capacity for loss and instances where a financial advisor has not understood the product it was recommending and as a result has not adequately explained the features and risks associated with the product. The Credit and Investments Ombudsman told the Commission that of the complaints it received about financial advisers, the largest proportion was about inappropriate advice, around 39% followed by excessive or incorrectly charged fees, 28% of complaints, conflict of interest, around 15% of complaints, and failure to follow a customer's instructions, around 11% of complaints. The Credit and Investments Ombudsman provided the Commission with some examples of systemic issues or serious misconduct, which including advice advising consumers to borrow against the equity in their homes in order to invest in managed investment funds without any reasonable basis, advising consumers to establish a self-managed superannuation fund where such advice was not appropriate for the customer's, financial, the customer's personal financial circumstances, advising customers to purchase investments which were not appropriate for their personal circumstances and advising customers to invest in property development schemes in which the authorised representatives had an undisclosed interest. The Association of Financial Advisors, or the AFA, is a professional association with approximately 4,300 members the majority of whom are practising financial advisers who are authorised representatives of licensees. The AFA told the Commission that membership of professional associations has increased significantly in the last 10 years. The AFA told the Commission it has its own recognised professional designation, its own code of conduct, a formal complaints process and disciplinary procedures. The Commission will hear evidence from the AFA about its disciplinary processes for responding to misconduct by financial advisers later in these hearings. The Financial Planning Association of Australia, or the FPA, is another professional association that represents the professional interests of financial planners. There are over 13,000 members or affiliates of the FPA. The FPA has established an independent body, the Conduct Review Commission, for the purpose of investigating complaints and managing disciplinary proceedings to ensure that members are held accountable to the FPA Code of Professional Practice and Code of Ethics. The FPA has provided the Commission with statements of reasons for determinations issued by the Conduct Review Commission since 1 January 2008. The majority of these relate to inappropriate advice given by financial advisers, including failing to adequately explain risk to clients and failing to take personal circumstances into account. The Commission will also hear evidence from the FPA about its disciplinary processes for responding to misconduct by financial advisers later in these hearings. We turn to the information provided to the Commission by financial services entities about whether their own conduct has constituted misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations. This information has been provided in response to the letters from you, Commissioner, sent late last year and early this year, asking entities to identify any misconduct it had engaged in or conduct falling below community standards or expectations since 1 January 2008. We will summarise aspects of the responses from these entities, uh, the entities that are the subject of the case studies in these hearings. In doing so, we will again refer to events 
of actual misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations that have been acknowledged. It should again be noted that many of these acknowledged events of misconduct or conduct falling below standards and expectations affected large numbers of customers, in some cases thousands of customers, and the event may well have extended over the course of a number of years. We will deal with the responses from the entities relevant to these case studies in alphabetical order. We start with AMP and its related entities, which have provided three submissions to the Commission. AMP told the Commission that its advice business authorises the provision of financial advice services by approximately 2,800 financial advisers across Australia, who run approximately 1,500 financial advice practices through AMP's various advice licensees. Over half of these financial advisers are licensed with AMP Financial Planning. Approximately 1,000 are licensed with Charter Financial Planning or Hillross <coughs> Financial Services. AMP acknowledged in its submissions that it has engaged in conduct that it characterised as possible misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to the provision of financial advice. We give some examples of its acknowledgements. First, AMP made a series of acknowledgements of conduct that it described as involving possible contraventions of the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act in relation to fees for no service. AMP acknowledged 196 events across 14 AMP advice licensees of advisers failing to provide customers with services for which they had paid during the period from 1 July 2008 to 30 June 2015. This resulted in $193,519 being paid to customers in compensation. AMP also acknowledged the following six events, which involved an AMP licensee continuing to charge a customer fees for service that were not provided by the licensee or the advisor during the period from 1 July 2008 to 30 June 2015. First, clients were charged ongoing service fees without receiving services after the client's advisor sold the rights to the service and the right to be paid by the clients to an AMP licensee under a contractual arrangement sometimes referred to as the buyer of last resort. Upon acquisition by the licensee, the clients were placed into a central pool. For so long as the clients remained in the central pool, the clients did not receive services but AMP licensees continued to charge fees to approximately 14,000 clients in this pool. In some cases, this was because of a systems error, but in others, it was because AMP applied an internal business rule that clients could continue to be charged fees for 90 days. Approximately $3.69 million has been repaid to customers. Second, clients were charged ongoing service fees but did not receive service in circumstances where the client's advisor had departed AMP and AMP decided to ring fence the clients of the former advisor. As at 13 February 2018, approximately 10,685 customers had been identified as affected by this conduct and AMP estimated that approximately 1.08 million will be repaid to customers as a result of this conduct. Third, customers were charged ongoing service fees after an advisor's authorisation had been terminated. As at 13 February this year, approximately 3,108 customers had been identified as affected by this conduct and approximately $1.2 million will be repaid to these customers. 
Fourth, AMP acknowledged that it had inadequate processes to ensure delivery of ongoing service fees where customer registers were acquired by one AMP practice from another AMP practice. As at the 13th of February this year, approximately 1,167 customers were identified as having been affected by this conduct and approximately $1.022 million has been repaid to these customers. Fifth, AMP acknowledged that it had incorrectly charged ongoing service fees where an AMP advice licensee had acquired the rights associated with a client register but provided no services for the fees that were being charged. As at the 13th of February this year, approximately 27 customers have been identified as affected by this conduct and $47,000 has been repaid to those customers. Sixth, AMP acknowledged possible misconduct in relation to its reporting to ASIC of its charging of fees for no service. AMP's conduct in relation to charging fees for no service will be examined further in one of the case studies in these hearings. Second, in respect of inappropriate advice and improper conduct by financial advisers, AMP acknowledged that since 2009 it has identified 81 advisers with potential serious compliance concerns. This is a phrase defined by ASIC as including circumstances where a person has engaged in conduct that is dishonest, illegal, deceptive or fraudulent or gross incompetence or gross negligence. AMP also acknowledged that in this period it had identified 440 advisers with potential other compliance concerns, a phrase defined by ASIC as including circumstances where a person has engaged in conduct that would be a breach of internal business rules or standards, which results in an adverse finding from audits conducted by or for the licensee, or which results in actual or potential financial loss to clients as a result of the advice received. AMP acknowledged that inappropriate advice by 14 advisers between 1 January 2009 and 30 June 2015 had resulted in compensation being paid to 1,079 customers. The amount of the compensation was not provided. AMP also acknowledged misconduct which occurred during the period from March 2010 to September 2014 that it described as insurance rewriting conduct. This was said to involve instances where an authorised representative recommended to a customer that they cancel their existing AMP life insurance policy and replace it with a new AMP life insurance policy, which enabled the authorised representative to collect the maximum rate of upfront commission payable. That commission was higher than the commission that would have been payable had the policies been transferred using an internal transfer function. A AMP acknowledged that one former advisor had engaged in this conduct approximately 57 times in respect of 49 clients, leading to compensation for seven customers of $61,777. This conduct is the subject of ongoing investigations by ASIC. In the course of those investigations, Five other advisers have been identified as having engaged in the same conduct, with two of those advisers now banned by ASIC. AMP provided a supplementary submission in which it acknowledged further identified possible misconduct, including 126 additional advisers who had engaged in possible misconduct, such as charging fees for no service or providing inappropriate advice. Of these advisers, AMP identified only one as currently being involved with its remediation program. AMP also spoke of 28 further advisers who in had engaged in conduct that breached a statute, regulation, standard or code. 
the provision of inappropriate financial advice by three advisers associated with AMP, each of whom AMP has acknowledged engaged in conduct that it reported to ASIC as giving rise to serious compliance concerns, will be the subject of a case study in these hearings. We turn next to ANZ and its related entities, which have provided two submissions to the Commission. Yesterday, ANZ notified the Commission of a number of errors in parts of these submissions that were relevant to this hearing block, which concerned, among other things, the number of authorised representatives of its aligned dealer group companies who had failed to provide periodic review services over a specific period. We will return to this correction. ANZ told the Commission that its Wealth Division provides financial advice to approximately 285,000 Australians through a network of approximately 872 authorised representatives and employed financial advisers. ANZ's advice business is conducted by ANZ Banking Group Limited under the trading name ANZ Financial Planning and by three subsidiaries being Financial Services Partners, RI Advice Group and Millennium 3. ANZ acknowledged that it has engaged in misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations relating to the provision of financial advice. We give some examples of ANZ's acknowledgements. First, ANZ acknowledged misconduct in relation to fees for no service. ANZ acknowledged that between 2006 and 2013, more than 10,000 Prime Access customers paid fees for documented annual reviews that were never provided by ANZ financial planners. ANZ acknowledged that it had compensated these 10,135 affected customers a total amount of $46.769 million in respect of this misconduct. ANZ also acknowledged that it had identified failures by four of its authorised representatives to provide documented annual reviews to 691 customers between May 2013 and April 2016. In the corrected submissions provided to the Commission yesterday, ANZ acknowledged that these failures involved eight rather than four of its authorised representatives, periodic reviews rather than annual reviews, and 813 rather than 691 customers. ANZ also told the Commission yesterday that there were also other authorised representatives of their aligned dealer groups in respect of whom annual audits or compliance reviews indicated isolated incidents of non-delivery of ongoing advice services as contractually required. ANZ also acknowledged that from 2003 to 2015, certain entities associated with ANZ deducted fees from the accounts of about 2,900 members of managed investment schemes and superannuation funds. The fees were supposed to be for ongoing services provided to each member by a financial advisor, but none of the members had an allocated financial advisor and as a result, none of the members received any services. The total fees deducted from the accounts of these members were $931,647. ANZ also acknowledged that between June 2007 and August 2016, service fees were deducted from customers' accounts in amounts or at rates in excess of those quoted in their service agreements. This, this affected approximately 4,035 customers to a total cost of $4.5 million. During this time period, ANZ also continued to deduct ongoing service fees from the accounts of certain customers who had cancelled their services. The total number of customers affected by this event has not yet been determined. 
At this stage of its investigation, ANZ believes that this event affected at least 198 customers, with a cost to those customers of at least $564,000. In the weeks prior to these hearings, on the 29th of March this year, ANZ entered into an enforceable undertaking with ASIC in respect of the fees for no service misconduct relating to its prime access customers. The enforceable undertaking requires ANZ, among other things, to pay a community benefit totalling I'm sorry, a community benefit payment totalling three million dollars to provide an audited attestation from ANZ's senior management to provide reasonable assurance that the bank has, since 2014, provided documented annual reviews to customers who were entitled to such reviews, and also to provide further audited attestations from senior management as to the improvements that the bank has made to its compliance systems and processes and that the design and implementation of those systems and processes will seek to ensure documented annual reviews are provided in accordance with the ANZ Prime Access Package. In addition to its acknowledgments of misconduct in relation to fees for no service, ANZ also made acknowledgments in respect of inappropriate advice and improper conduct by financial advisers. ANZ acknowledged that in response to a notice issued by ASIC in 2015, it had identified 39 advisers who were employed or authorised by ANZ who had engaged in improper or non-compliant conduct between the 1st of January 2009 and the 7th of July 2015. ANZ also acknowledged that between 1 July 2015 and the 31st of December last year, it had made an additional 40 reports or notifications to ASIC concerning the conduct of a total of 41 financial advisers or authorised representatives. The advisor misconduct covered by these notifications included improper use of customer funds, misleading conduct concerning advisers' qualifications or authorisations, falsifying customer or compliance documentation, deliberate overcharging of fees, provision of poor quality advice and failures to comply with disclosure obligations. Among the notifications, ANZ acknowledged that there were at least 30 events of misconduct or potential misconduct in relation to the appropriateness of advice. This included advice that had been provided with a lack of a reasonable basis, advice that was of little or no benefit to the customer but generated fees for the advisor, cases where there was no evidence that sufficient research had been undertaken before the advice was given, and cases where advisers had not accurately disclosed fees. The provision of inappropriate financial advice by authorised representatives of two of ANZ's aligned dealer group companies, RI Advice Group and Millennium 3, each of whom ANZ acknowledged had engaged in misconduct, will be the subject of a case study in these hearings. ANZ also acknowledged at least 56 events of misconduct or potential misconduct relating to improper conduct by financial advisers. These included circumstances where customer signatures were forged or falsified, customers impersonated, where there had been fraudulent uses of powers of attorney, where financial advisers had falsely witnessed documents or facilitated documents being falsely witnessed, or where customer funds had been transferred into a financial advisor's personal bank account. ANZ acknowledged that on 14 January this year, it had notified ASIC that a further 30 advisers had falsely witnessed or facilitated the false witnessing of certain forms signed by customers. <coughs> Improper conduct by an authorised representative of Millennium 3, which ANZ has acknowledged constituted misconduct, will be the subject of a case study in these hearings. 
Further, ANZ acknowledged misconduct by ANZ financial planning in failing to pay agreed rebates on approximately $8.5 million of trail commissions to approximately 6,800 customers between 2009 and 2017. By September 2010, compensation totalling $432,000, inclusive of lost earnings, had been paid to 698 affected customers. By May 2014, further compensation, totalling $114,000, had been paid to 506 affected customers. Further remediation is expected to commence in about March this year and ANZ estimates it will pay affected customers in excess of $12.5 million in remediation in respect of this conduct, including lost earnings of customers of approximately $4.8 million. We turn next to CBA and its related entities, which have provided three submissions to the Commission. CBA told the Commission that it provides financial advice services through its related licensees, including Commonwealth Financial Planning, Count Financial, Financial Wisdom and, prior to 2016, BW Financial Advice. CBA has acknowledged misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in relation to the provision of financial advice. Again, we give some examples of CBA's acknowledgements. First, CBA's acknowledged misconduct includes misconduct in relation to fees for no service. CBA identified instances in the period from July 2007 to June 2015 where clients of Commonwealth Financial Planning, BW Financial Advice and Count Financial were charged ongoing fees for financial advice when no financial advice services were provided. CBA acknowledged that as at the end of last year, approximately $118.5 million of refunds, including interest, has been offered or paid to customers affected by this conduct. Shortly prior to the commencement of these hearings, on the 9th of April, Commonwealth Financial Planning and BW Financial Advice entered into an enforceable undertaking with ASIC in relation to a failure to provide or failure to locate evidence regarding the provision of annual reviews to approximately 31,500 ongoing service customers in the period from July 2007 to June 2015 for Commonwealth Financial Planning and from November 2010 to June 2015 for BW Financial Advice. The enforceable undertaking requires, among other things, the entities to pay a community benefit payment of $3 million in total, Commonwealth Financial Planning to provide an attestation from senior management setting out the material changes that have been made to its compliance systems and processes in response to the misconduct, and Commonwealth Financial Planning is to provide further attestations from senior management, supported by an expert report, that its compliance systems and processes are now reasonably adequate to track its contractual obligations to its ongoing service clients, and that it has taken reasonable steps to identify and remediate its ongoing service customers who did not receive annual reviews in the period from July 15 to January 2018. CBA's conduct in respect of charging fees for no service will be examined in one of the case studies in these hearings. In respect of inappropriate advice, CBA acknowledged that in the period since 1 January 2013, it had made 20 breach notifications to ASIC in relation to actual or likely breaches of the Corporations Act by an advisor licensed by Commonwealth Financial Planning, Financial Wisdom or Count Financial. It had made a further five breach notifications in relation to advisers identified through file reviews which were conducted in accordance with 
the additional licence conditions applied to the financial services licences held by Commonwealth Financial Planning and Financial Wisdom, that it had made notifications in respect of a further 20 advisers in relation to serious compliance concerns, that it had made good governance notifications in respect of a further 13 advisers, which largely related to signature irregularities in documents on client files, that 15 former CBA employees or representatives have been the subject of ASIC banning orders or enforceable undertakings since 1 January 2013, and that at, as at the end of last year, it has paid or offered to pay approximately $96 million to customers relating to the provision of poor financial advice or advisor misconduct. In its third submission, provided to the Commission on the final day of the first round of hearings, CBA acknowledged 76 specific events of misconduct over the last five years that related to financial advice. We turn to NAB and its related entities, which have provided two submissions to the Commission. NAB told the Commission that it provides financial advice, advice services to consumers through financial advisers employed by NAB directly and through advisers employed or authorised by its related licensees, including Apogee Financial Planning, Godfrey Pembroke, GWM Advisor Services, JB Ware and Meritum Financial Group. NAB acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations in connection with the provision of financial advice. We give the following examples of those acknowledgements. First, NAB also acknowledged misconduct in relation to fees for no service. NAB acknowledged misconduct concerning the charging of advisor service fees between 2008 and 2015 and of plan service fees between September 2012 and January 2017 in circumstances where no advisor was allocated to the client. NAB told the Commission that as at the 31st of January this year, it has paid or agreed to pay approximately $6.6 .6 million in compensation to more than 25,000 clients affected by the misconduct concerning the charging of advisor service fees and approximately $35 million in compensation to more than 220,000 clients affected by the misconduct concerning the charging of plan service fees. NAB also told the Commission that it was investigating further circumstances where fees were charged to clients but the relevant services may not have been provided. Second, NAB acknowledged a number of events in relation to the provision of inappropriate advice. NAB acknowledged that in the period from 1 January 2009 to 29 January this year, it had notified ASIC or otherwise discussed with ASIC approximately 68 advisers who it had identified as giving rise to serious compliance concerns. The concerns included conduct involving multiple instances of inappropriate advice leading to customer loss, backdating of documents, misleading statements and repeat, repeated compliance breaches. NAB acknowledged that between 1 January 2010 and 30 September 2017, it had paid approximately $38 million to customers, which it said included amounts which were not specified, paid as compensation to customers for financial advisor misconduct. NAB acknowledged that in the period from 1 January 2009 to 29 January this year, it had identified other instances where customers had been provided with inappropriate advice, which failed to comply with the requirement to have a reasonable basis for the advice and to act in the customer's best interests, including an unspecified number of instances of failing to provide advice tailored to the customer's objectives or appropriate for the customer's risk tolerance, 
an unspecified number of instances of recommendations of a geared strategy that was inappropriate and an unspecified number of instances of failing to recommend withdrawal from a geared financial product during a cooling off period when the customer's circumstances had changed. NAB also acknowledged that it had identified an unspecified number of other instances where customers had been provided with inappropriate advice about insurance, including failing to give appropriate insurance advice given the customer's individual circumstances, including resulting in a customer being uninsured, cancelling a customer's insurance policies before new insurance was in place, and recommending a switch to new insurance which did not benefit the customer. Third, NAB identified instances of improper conduct by employed financial advisors and authorised representatives of NAB wealth entities, including dishonest or otherwise serious illegal conduct, such as misappropriation of funds and the provision of advice to invest in a company in which the in which the authorised representative had a financial interest between at least 2011 and 2016. NAB acknowledged involvement or potential involvement by advisers in inappropriate early release schemes between at least 2016 and 2017, allowing members access to superannuation benefits before they were entitled to them and it acknowledged the provision of advice by advisers outside the scope of their authority between at least 2009 and October 2016. In addition, NAB acknowledged that in the period from 1 January 2009 to 29 January this year, there were instances where it had failed to prevent the misappropriation of customer funds, including misappropriation by financial advisers. The acknowledgements of improper conduct by NAB also included an acknowledgement that as at October last year, it had identified 353 NAB employees who had been involved in incorrectly witnessing binding beneficiary nomination forms for superannuation funds. This incorrect witnessing potentially affected the validity of beneficiary nomination forms for about 2,520 customers. This conduct will be the subject of a case study in these hearings. Fourth, NAB acknowledged a number of issues in relation to the disclosure that it has made to its customers. NAB acknowledged that a number of group licensees had failed to disclose relationships between advisors, advice licensees, and other members of the NAB group that issue investments products from 2008 to March 2016. The affected customers received advice to acquire products issued by certain group entities and were provided with statements of advice and financial services guides which did not fully disclose the association between the advice licensee and the issuers of the recommended investments. NAB also acknowledged that in the period from 2008 to March 2016, approximately 150,000 customers received deficient disclosure, either in statements of advice or financial services guides, in relation to MLC branded products and other investment manager products. Finally, we turn to Westpac and its related entities, which have provided a number of submissions and supporting documents to the Commission. Westpac told the Commission that its financial advice business unit, BT Financial Group, provides financial product advice on wealth creation and protection, superannuation and retirement planning. Financial advisors, advisors providing such advice are either employees of Westpac or Westpac Financial Consultants Limited, or are authorised to provide advice under a financial services licence operated by two subsidiaries of Westpac, Securator Financial Group and Magnitude Group. As at December last year, there were a total of 1,012 employed financial advisors or advisors operating under the Securator and Magnitude licences. 
Westpac acknowledged that it had engaged in misconduct or conduct falling below community standards and expectations in connection with the provision of financial advice. Again, we give examples of those acknowledgements. The first example relates to acknowledged misconduct in relation to fees for no service. Westpac acknowledged that BT Financial Group commenced an ongoing advice services review program in 2016. This program identified retail clients who in the period from 1 July 2008 to 31 December 2015 had been charged fees for ongoing advice where they had not received the service paid or evidence of such service uh, being provided could not be located in BT Financial Group's records. As at the 31st of December last year, BT Financial Group, through its structured remediation programs, had paid compensation in excess of $3.2 million to 435 clients as a result of issues identified in the ongoing advice services review program. Westpac also noted that its FY17 annual results provisioned approximately $24 million for refunds of fee payments related to Westpac employed financial advisors identified in the ongoing advice services review program. Second, Westpac acknowledged misconduct or conduct falling below community expectations and standards in relation to inappropriate or inadequate advice, including the following. A significant review established in 2015 and known as the Advice Compliance Program had identified 22 financial advisors who had provided inappropriate advice and who were reported to ASIC. BT Financial Group also participated in ASIC's Advice Compliance Project, as a result of which a further 11 financial advisors were identified as potentially providing what was referred to as problematic advice. Since 2015, BT Financial Group has identified a further 15 advisers with inappropriate advice issues. And as at the 29th of January last year, Westpac had paid a total of $12.568 million in compensation to 205 clients, with a further approximately $1 million in compensation offered but not yet accepted. Westpac has not yet completed its review of the advice received by 468 customers who received advice from the original 22 advisers identified. Westpac also provided specific examples of inappropriate advice by four advisers, being an advisor who provided inappropriate personal advice primarily relating to gearing recommendations, which resulted in 116 clients requiring remediation, an advisor who had provided inappropriate advice relating to establishment of self-managed superannuation funds and using limited recourse borrowing arrangements to fund the purchase of real property, two advisers whose conduct gave rise to concerns of inadequate disclosure, charging of ongoing fees without providing the relevant services, inadequate documentation of clients' goals and objectives, inadequate risk profiling, and no documented reasonable basis for providing the advice provided or for superannuation switching. Uh, Westpac also identified an advisor who had provided standardised advice across his whole client base and recorded identical goals and objectives for many of his clients. <coughs> These advisers were reported to ASIC and three have been the subject of banning orders. The provision of inappropriate financial advice by two employees of Westpac, each of whom Westpac has acknowledged engaged in misconduct, will be the subject of a case study in these hearings. Westpac also acknowledged the following misconduct or conduct falling below community expectations and standards in relation to improper conduct of financial advisers. One BT financial group advisor had established 72 life insurance policies in the names of clients with no existing accounts 
with a view to dishonestly obtaining a benefit through the sale of these policies. Criminal charges were laid by Victoria Police and the adviser was permanently banned by ASIC. A financial adviser employed by an authorised representative of magnitude had performed unauthorised transactions in accounts of five of their clients. Three of the clients suffered losses as a result of the transactions. The adviser was criminally prosecuted and sentenced for charges including theft. And $2.75 million was repaid to 1,996 impacted customers as a result of advice fees paid between 1998 and 2012 for BT investment wrap or super wrap that may have been higher than the maximum fee ranges noted in the disclosure documents. We turn now to the particular topics through which the conduct of financial services entities will be addressed in this round of hearings. The first topic that we will explore is fees for no service. Two case studies will be presented which are relevant to the issues raised. The first case study concerns AMP. As we have already mentioned, AMP operates a very large network of authorised representatives through a number of licensees. Each licensee offers one or more services on an ongoing fee basis. The contractual arrangements between the licensees and the advisers, the authorised representatives, typically include a buyback clause by which the advisers client register can be acquired by the licensee to be held by the licensee until being on sold. The first case study will examine AMP's conduct in connection with the charging of fees to clients that its licensees had bought back from advisers who did not receive services. The second case study about fees for no service concerns CBA and in particular Commonwealth Bank Financial Planning, Count Financial and BW Financial Advice. Each of those entities offered services on an ongoing fee basis. The precise services that were offered in exchange for an ongoing fee differed, but often clients received no service or did not receive the services that they were contractually entitled to. Despite that, the ongoing fees continued to be deducted from the client's investments. The second topic we will deal with in these case studies relates to the provision of inappropriate advice. Inappropriate advice can be broadly described as advice that does not comply with the best interests obligation and related obligations in the Corporations Act or advice which fails to take into account a client's circumstances. Three case studies about inappropriate advice will be presented. The first case study concerns Westpac and two financial advisers who provided advice on behalf of Westpac. Mr. Ramakrishnan Mahadevan and Mr. Andrew Smith. This case study will consider the financial advice provided by those two advisers and the adequacy of Westpac's systems and processes for preventing and detecting inappropriate advice by employed financial advisers. The second case study concerns ANZ and two financial advisers who were authorised representatives of companies owned by ANZ. Mr John Doyle, who was an authorised representative of RI Advice Group, and Mr Christopher Harris, who was an authorised representative of Millennium 3. This case study will consider the financial advice provided by those two advisers and the adequacy of the systems of ANZ, RI Advice Group and Millennium 3 for preventing and detecting inappropriate advice by authorised representatives. The third case study concerns three advisers within AMP's network. The first was an authorised representative of AMP Financial Planning. The second, Jennifer Coleman, was an authorised representative of Charter. The third, Adam Palmer, was an authorised representative of Genesis Wealth Advisors. This case study will consider specific forms of inappropriate advice, including insurance switching, superannuation switching, self-managed superannuation fund advice and conflicted advice. 
It will also consider systemic issues concerning the recruitment of advisers, the vetting of advice and client remediation. The third topic we will deal with in this round of hearings relates to conduct of financial advisers that can be described as improper. Two case studies will be presented. The first concerns NAB and the incorrect witnessing of beneficiary nomination forms by NAB financial advisers. In late 2016, NAB identified a financial advisor who had forged two customers' initials and asked another employee to falsely witness a beneficiary nomination form. By October the following year, NAB had identified 353 employees who had been involved in incorrectly witnessing binding beneficiary nomination forms for superannuation funds. This incorrect witnessing, as we have already noted, potentially affected the validity of beneficiary nomination forms for about 2,500 customers. The second case study on this topic concerns a financial advisor who provided advice as an authorised representative of Millennium 3, which is wholly owned by ANZ. This financial advisor engaged in a range of improper conduct, including falsifying documents, misappropriating customer funds, and engaging in misleading and deceptive conduct in relation to customers. The final topic we will deal with in these hearings is the disciplinary system within the financial advice sector. Evidence will be received from representatives of Dover Financial Advisers, ASIC, the FPA and the AFA. Through the witnesses throughout these hearings, we will explore issues concerning the adequacy of the current arrangements for disciplining financial advisers. In particular, by examining the ways in which disciplinary matters are currently dealt with in relation to financial advisers, this case study will highlight some of the gaps in the existing system. The case studies that we will examine in these hearings raise a number of common themes and questions for consideration including the following. Was the misconduct in question attributable to a particular culture, system or practice within the entity, including in particular remuneration, incentive or commission <coughs> arrangements? Why did, the misconduct <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> Why did the misconduct go undetected and in some instances for a long period of time? Were the entity's processes adequate to prevent and detect misconduct of this nature? Did the entity respond in a timely and sufficient way to the misconduct? Have the legislative reforms to date been successful in preventing misconduct? If not, why is this the case? Over the course of the next two weeks, evidence will also be presented from some members of the public who will share their experiences with financial advice. One member of the public, Mrs McDowell, will give evidence about advice received from a senior financial advisor employed by BT Financial Group, which is part of Westpac. Mrs McDowell and her husband sought financial advice about a retirement strategy, which included purchasing and operating a bed and breakfast with superannuation funds. Mrs McDowell will give evidence about the financial impact this advice had on her and on her husband, including the loss of their family home. Mrs McDowell will also give evidence about her experience with complaints processes relating to financial advice in relation both to Westpac and to the Financial Ombudsman Service. A second member of the public, Ms McKenna, will give evidence about her experience with a financial advisor from a non-aligned financial advice entity, Henderson Maxwell. Ms McKenna similarly sought advice relating to superannuation and retirement strategy. She will give evidence that the advice she received, particularly in relation to a recommendation to establish a self-managed superannuation fund, was inappropriate for her circumstances and would have led to immediate and significant financial detriment had it been implemented. She will also give evidence about her experiences with the disciplinary processes of the FPA. Commissioner, that concludes this opening address. 
The first witness will be Mr Peter Kell, the Deputy Chair of ASIC. If yeah. the Commissioner would give us a moment to arrange the bar table for ASIC's representatives. Well, ASIC can, I think uh, Council can move him. There's not any move out, is there? No. So no. I think we can wait long enough while ASIC Council move their goods, chattels and baggage train. Maybe I'm an optimist at heart. <laughs>